everybody. Ted Haggard here from St. James Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And Gail and I are currently pastoring the um, storehouse, which is the house church ministry of St. James Church. And it's really a group of pilgrims gathering together to just grow in our walk with the Lord and stay on the straight and narrow path. If any of you are in Colorado Springs and you'd like to join with us, actually beginning this Wednesday night, the 22nd, we're going to be studying Pilgrim's Progress. And we'll be studying the new uh, the new um, uh, update of this, this, uh, this right here, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Most of you probably know that this is the second best selling book. In history, the first best selling book in history is the Bible. And this, for over a hundred years, was um was a very, very popular book, and it continues to be the second best selling English book uh in the world. And so uh if you if you would like to uh walk through that book with us, we'll be doing that on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock. And then, of course, on Sunday mornings, we'll be studying the scriptures as usual. This morning, we are in Nehemiah, the fifth chapter. And Nehemiah, the fifth chapter, is the account of Nehemiah defending the oppressed. And I just want to read this for you very quickly out of the New Living Translation. Then I want to comment on it. Uh, Here it says, About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large family, we need families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we have had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters, and we are helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Uh, Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? I myself as well as my brothers and my workers have been lending the people money and gain uh, and uh, lending uh, the people money and grain. But now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to, to them this very day and repay, excuse me, I need to turn the page, the interest You charged uh, when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and, and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from the from your homes and from your property. The whole assembly responded, amen, and they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. For the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah, from the from the 20th year to the 32nd year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, neither I nor my officials drew on our official food allowance. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on the people, demanding a daily ration of ration of food and wine, besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of the people. But because I feared God, I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall and refused to acquire any land. And I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, 
even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from other lands. The provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine, yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. Remember, oh my God, all that I have done for these people and bless me for it. All right, let's talk about this just a little bit. This is very important. Many of you listening are Christian businessmen and Christian businesswomen. All right, my wife and I spent 22 years building New Life Church. We built it from a little prayer meeting in our house to a to a group of 14,000 people with a multi-million dollar budget. All during those years, I was on the same pay pay scale as the janitors, full-time janitors, as the associate pastors. We had up to 37 of them for a while uh, for for the uh, uh, busiest times. We had all we had over 154 full-time employees and I was on the same pay scale. You know why? It's because the senior pastor doesn't work any harder than the youth pastor. And the senior pastor doesn't even carry as much responsibility as the youth pastor. And so it costs me as a senior pastor just as much to buy a pair of jeans as it does the youth pastor or a janitor. We call the janitors uh, uh, hospitality people. And so so I had peers that had churches a small fraction of our size that were making over a million dollars a year. And it was robbery. It was wrong. It was profit taking. Then in 2006, we went through a scandal and I resigned everything so that I would not be in the way and not confuse people. So all the ministries that I was associated with could go on and prosper and be be strong. But here's what I'm seeing now. Now I'm seeing people taking advantage of other people by extreme profit taking. Gail and I have only been in one multi-level uh, in our lives, and it was a it was for health. It was a, a healthy multi-level, but we noticed after we were into it that the leaders of that multi-level were profit taking. They were taking too much, and it was hurting the people lower in the system. So we got out. The other day, I met a lady down at um, the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade. African American woman. She'd moved here from Detroit. Went in Detroit. She had a home. She sold it. She had some equity in her house, and she moved into an apartment complex here in Colorado Springs. That apartment complex signed a lease with her, a one-year lease. But during her lease, they came in, they revamped it, put in new uh, new uh, kitchen and things like that, which were good. Then they raised her rate five hundred dollars a month unannounced. She had one month to adjust to that. $500. Her rent went up. Excessive profit taking. Now, I know on a balance sheet, and many times our government will say it is the role of a corporation to give maximum profits to the shareholders. I think when they said that, that was a mistake. I think they should have said it is the role of publicly held corporations to give maximum profit to the shareholders balanced by maximum value to their customers. There needs to be a balance of maximum value to the customer as well as profit for the shareholders. I'm for profit. I'm for people becoming wealthy. Well, I love what Jeff Bezos is doing in the Mars, in in the effort to go to Mars. I love what Elon Musk is doing with his development and the inventions he's doing. I love what wealthy people do in a local church and for uh, universities and for things like that. I'm for profit taking, just not excessive profit taking. I th- and I know they try to balance this with government action, but that's not the way to do it. Every time the government gets involved, it goes squirrely and it just doesn't work right. The market needs to do it. And all people that are Christians or Jews need to understand that profit is good. Excessive profit is abuse. That's what this chapter says. We have a friend that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, guy who loves taking care of special needs kids. 
All right. So he helps with special needs people in our city for some of the entities that take care of special needs people. In one month, his rent went up $700. Now, I know somebody on a spreadsheet somewhere said, oh, you can get more. The market in Colorado Springs is allowing for higher higher uh, rents to be taken. Yeah, but most people that live in an apartment are hardworking people. Now, I know some people abuse the apartment and they cost the apartment owner. I know some people are not good people and they just take advantage of others, but it's on both ends. Okay, so the owner of that apartment building can build in for people that are going to tear up the apartment and uh, whatever, and we all pay for that kind of thing anytime there's an abusive person. But to excessively take profits and cause people that are working for X numbers of dollars an hour to struggle and to be in trouble, it's a terrible thing because of the $700 a month raise on his apartment, he ended up just having to rent a room from a buddy, moving from an apartment to a, to living with a buddy. And I don't know how he can afford to work with um, special needs people anymore. And the government spends a lot of money to in order to get the care for special needs people, but they require so much administration. Most of that money goes to administration, not to the people actually helping with special needs people. I remember years ago, this would be, I don't know, 25 or 30 years ago, there was a mortgage broker in our church. This was when I was at New Life, who was arranging mortgages for people to be able to borrow 100% of the value of their house. Now, I know some people think it's that's a good thing, but I called him into my office and I said, that's immoral. I said, you're causing those people to be so vulnerable to foreclosure. If they have a bad month or a bad two months, that's too close. I said, you can lend 75% of the value of a house. You can lend 80% of the value of a house. But that other 20% of equity is really important for people to have a little bit of a pad. And so he and I had a little debate about that, and he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't back off of selling 100% mortgages to people. Uh, it was legal then, and I understand it's legal again now. I don't know for sure. I'm not in the mortgage business. But I remember he did that. Then a year later, he and his wife, I don't know what else they were investing in, but he and his wife slipped out of town in the middle of the night. Okay, now, let me tell you something. We need to be responsible for what we do. I've had good days and bad days, but I don't shy away from them. I haven't changed my name. I haven't slipped out of town. I'm in the same. I'm in the same city where I prospered greatly, and in the same city where I went through great embarrassment. And so, at one time or another, we just need to be able to do the right thing. And as far as I know, through the years. I've done the right thing. So I've watched over and over and over again, wealthy people be the wonderful breakthrough for ministries like ours. I mean, I thank God that they had funds and they were able to help us and able to get things through and able to get things done. I've also seen wealthy people, though, just get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And the bottom line is you can only sleep in one bed at a time. And you can only drive one vehicle at a time. And I'm all for more efficiency. I'm all for first class so, the, so all of us can work when we need to fly from one place for another. I'm all for luxury hotels where a guy can get in there and do, guy or gal can get in there and do business and keep things going. But if that guy or gal is just taking advantage of other people to pad their bank accounts for no reason at all other than their personal comfort or to show off or to be arrogant, they're going to go to hell. Because our role is to prosper so that we can be a blessing to others. And our role is to own um, apartment complexes so that we can be a blessing to others and to provide goods and services at a good value so that we can be a blessing to others. Our life, if we think we're religious at all, is to be a blessing to others. If we spend all of our time just accumulating things for ourselves, we're no different than the pagans, and we will suffer from it. Now, back in this day, they didn't know about free market capitalism, so they thought interest was bad. Interest is not bad. Excessive interest is bad. Loan sharking is bad. All right? If you, if you loan money to somebody, 
make sure it's fair, and then work with them if necessary to make sure they can pay it back. But we shouldn't take advantage of one another. We shouldn't abuse one another. We need to be wise. We need to be givers. We need to be helpful. And we need to use our businesses and our opportunities to make life better for others. Yes, we need to make profits. Yes, It's okay for us and our children to live well and to have a healthy inheritance, but it is not right for us to take advantage of others for our own arrogance. All right. All right. I know you can't can't teach economics and you can't teach these things really in a 15-minute session, but I wanted you to get the point of this chapter, and I think I've illustrated it well enough, and so I would encourage you to share this video with some of your friends especially if you have some friends who um, have opportunity to multiply their money and to do a good job for people and uh, to help others along the way. All right. The Lord Jesus bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 